Well, it's 10 o'clock, so I think we'll go ahead and get started and just want to welcome everyone. What a wonderful turnout. Uh, my name is Lisa Hegarty. I'm with the PW Litchfield Heritage Center, formerly known as the Litchfield Park Historical Society. Um, and this lecture today is part of our Heritage Lecture Series. And we thank the, the City of Goodyear for allowing us to use this space and also um, the Georgia T. Lib Lord Library as well. Um, our organization focuses on bringing the history, arts, and culture of the Southwest Valley, which includes Goodyear, Avondale, Tolleson, Litchfield Park, and immediate surrounding area. And we are actually a museum. It's very small, so we do a lot of things off-site, but we have wonderful exhibits. We're located on the northwest corner of Litchfield Road in Camelback. And uh, this area has an incredibly rich and interesting uh, history, a unique place in Arizona history. And not only do we host lectures like these, we have enrichment classes, we have cultural events. Um, in December, we will have our third annual Las Posadas procession. Um, you can learn more about that if you're interested, if you stop by our table after the, the presentation. Um, and we have uh, two new exhibits that, have, that are going up. And so we have an exhibit opening on October 1st from 1 to 3 p.m. And the topic of those two exhibits, the first is Paul Litchfield's Rancho La Loma, which portrays life on the hilltop property that belonged to the Litchfields. It was their winter retreat. It was a lush garden setting. Um, again, it was located, uh, the property is still there, um, Camelback and Litchfield Roads, and it has a very interesting history. Not only was it a retreat for the family, but lots of famous guests uh, would visit, and there were many large public gatherings on their property that drew people from all over the valley. And our second exhibit is the Wigwam from Necessity to Luxury, which traces the iconic resort's history, its 100 year plus history, from its early days as simply a guest house for visiting Goodyear Tire and Rubber executives, to its evolution in sort of a, a western themed cowboy getaway, to a golf resort, to you know the recognition it receives today for being a historic resort. So those two exhibits are opening October 1st. Uh, there'll be refreshments and kids activities as well at that event. And I also want to highlight our next speaker in our series in um, November. Uh, we'll be hosting on November 16th, Thursday, 10 a.m. We'll be here at the Goodyear City Complex, but we'll be over in the City Council Chambers. And we have a special uh, speaker that day. We will have local award-winning author Stella Pope Duarte, and she will speak about her historical novel, Let Their Spirits Dance, which is a passionate story of a family's spiritual cross-country trip to the Vietnam Memorial Wall. With this year marking the 50th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War, she'll offer her reflections on what it meant to research and write her book, which is built upon numerous interviews of veterans from the U.S. and Vietnam, Vietnamese soldiers who served with U.S. forces. Um, her books have won awards um, nationwide, including a 2009 American Book Award, uh, Pulitzer Prize nomination. Um, so we're really excited to have her. So mark your calendars. We hope you can come out for that. So that's a little bit about us and what we have going on. And again, visit our table afterwards. Uh, we have an email list you can sign up for as well, pick up any information. Um, and with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our special guest today. Candy Wagenbach joined the National Society of the Daughters of, American, of the American Revolution on April 3, 1990. She has been a member for 33 years. She served in Colorado for 10 years and has been a member in Arizona for 21 years. She has served at the state level as recording secretary, corresponding secretary, and library. She currently serves in the position of co-chair of the state conference and events committee. She has served on the national level of the development committee and as an official reader for National Congress. She has nine family members who have been uh, DAR members. She holds a degree from the University of Colorado in social work and business and has a master's degree in gerontology administration. She worked in senior care for more than 30 years and also for the Estee Lauder cosmetic firm for 20 years. She holds the designation as a certified fundraising executive. She has two sons, James and William, 
James is a retired FBI agent and currently serves as chief of uh, 1700 Man Sheriff's Department in Fort Myers, Florida. And her son William works for the city of Lakewood in Colorado. Her grandson Christopher is a University of Texas graduate and currently works for Amazon Colorado. She lives in Old Town in the Old Town Scottsdale Historic District with her five cats. And as she says, she might fit into the crazy cat lady category. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Miss Candy Wagon. It's such a pleasure and such an honor. I love the microphone. I never talk without a microphone. You know, you go places and people say, oh, I have a loud voice. I don't need a microphone. And nobody's hearing them. I, 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 I so believe in microphones. Um, but where I was going with this is it's an honor to be here today. And I'm gonna, I've never done two programs, and today, but they understand you all are just gluttons for punishment. You sit for an hour. You know, when you read um, information, it says don't talk more than 25 minutes and maybe 20, because that's all people can pay attention for. So you definitely are an outstanding group. Uh, for some of you that are standing, that you could sit on the table. For an hour, I hate to see you stand. Um, so make yourselves comfortable back there, and uh, we ran out of chairs, and we tried to find people with more chairs, but we couldn't seem to find them. So, um, do, we're going to have to do the best we can. Um, but let me tell you, the Code Girls, two different groups of women. I specialize on women in World War II. And um, the Code Girls were basically more wealthy women that were recruited from um, Eastern colleges, women's colleges. And then the next one I'm going to do is the 6888, which was all black women. And that was totally different. Um, these women were recruited and they weren't even going to let them in. And uh, a lot of them went in because they were patriotic. A lot of them went in because they felt that this would give them an opportunity um, to build a better life. And so um, I think it's interesting because you have two, two very different, two very effective groups of women during World War II. And, and we always think our veterans and we always think of our men veterans, but really when you start studying all the things Ever-changing locations hampered mail delivery to service members, with 7 million Americans in the European theater. Many shared common names. For instance, 7,500 names were Robert Smith. Service members noticed that they were not getting mail from home, and Army officials reported that the lack of reliable mail delivery was hurting morale. One general actually predicted that the backlog in Birmingham would take six months to process. But who would take this massive task? Under the heading of personal problems, an adjutant general's report stated that since day day, and for a long time prior to that date, a shortage of qualified postal employees had existed within the European theater. The Postal Division continually sought to secure additional officers by requisitions from the reinforcement system and from the zone of the interior. Although they were personnel stationed in Birmingham to handle the mail, the system was in complete chaos. Slide three. The Women's Air Corps WAC of the United States Army was created by a law signed by President Franklin E. Roosevelt on July 1, 1943. The WAC was converted from the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, which had been created in 1942, but did not have the official military status. First, Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and the civil rights leader, Dr. Mary McLean, 
or two, successfully advocated for the admittance of the African American women as enlisted personnel and officers in the WAC. Although, as in the rest of the Army, segregation prevailed, after several units of white women were sent to serve in the European theater, African American organizations pressed the War Department to extend the opportunity to serve overseas to African American WACs. In November 1944, the War Department acquiesced, despite slow recruitment of volunteers, a battle, um, a battalion of 824 enlisted personnel and 31 officers. All African American women drawn from the WAC, the Armed Services Forces, and the Army Air Forces were was created and eventually designed as the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion, nicknamed the 6888. The 6888 included the Headworth Company of Administrative and Service Support and Companies A, B, C, and D, each commanded by a captain or a first lieutenant, major, later lieutenant, Colonel Charity Edna Adams, who took the surname early in her marriage, was selected to command. The battalion was trained for their overseas mission at Fort Agalutica, Georgia. Slide four. Their training was very rigorous. They crawled under logs wearing gas masks and jumped over trenches. The women learned to identify enemy aircraft, ships, and weapons, learned to climb ropes, to board and evacuate ships, and to do long marches with red socks. In January 1945, the women traveled by train to Camp Shanks, New York, which was the point at which they left the United States. This will be slide five. On February 3rd, 1945, the first contingent of the battalion sailed for Britain. Their ship, the La de France, survived close encounters with Nazi U-boats and arrived in Glasgow, Scotland on the 14th of February, where a German VI rocket exploded near the dock, causing the women to run for cover. They traveled by train to Birmingham, England. Within a few days of their arrival, they held a military parade for Lieutenant General John C.H. Lee, which was watched by a number of curious local citizens. A second contingent arrived in Birmingham from Scotland 50 days later. Slide six. The six, troubles, the six triple eight battalion consisted of 855 black women and were the first African-American women battalion to be stationed in Europe during World War II. This is the battalion on parade in front of um, in France. Um, battalion members Lena King said she enlisted um, after a Jewish friend was killed in an Air Force, in the Air Force. She said, I felt that as an African-American, we wanted to show that we were involved in our country and loved it. Said the historian and author Susan Bolsey. 
Many join up the war effort out of a sense of duty. Many also look for the opportunity, long unaffordable to most black women, who are often retrograded to service roles such as maids and cooks. Those with, with undergraduate and higher degrees said they were hoping that the military would profit from their education and provide training for more skilled work. Increased pressure to set, disintegrate the military came from black newspapers, activists, and the NAACP even before the United States entered the war. Number nine, furloughs were common, and the women found time to relax and travel. The six AAA veterans also all spoke of how friendly the people of Birmingham welcomed wax into their homes and treated them with a respect many had never experienced in America. And even in different parts of Europe, travels in Britain and France were much different than travels at home. They were invited on trains and buses and treated with respect. The commander of the battalion, Allen, said she was waiting with her parents in a small, dirty, crowded, colored waiting room in the Atlantic Railroad Station. She recalls there were many military personnel roaming around the station, and two white military police addressed her with a question. Some people asked. Her response was, yes, I see. You want to know if I really am a major in the United States Army. Now I need some information. I can see your rank. I need your name, your serial number, your unit, and the location, and the name of your commanding officer. Adam suggested they report themselves before she had a chance to do so. Number 10. But it was snow in England. For many, the first adventure in snow. It was good for women to take a break and enjoy themselves. Just making this elite unit was demanding, and to be an officer in one of the 40, it was clear you had to be the best of the best. I was sure I would never pass recalls Captain Violet Hill, commander the commander. At that time, I had completed two years of college. Their goal was the 40 officers would then train the other enlisted women. Their standards, their expectations, and their hopes were high. They preferred women who had not only the education background, but also some military, some maturity, and work experience, which would, which would assist them in embarking on this endeavor. 11. The women of the 6th AAA ran their own mess hall, hair salons, refreshment bars, and other recreational facilities. The enlisted women were quartered in the old Edwards School, and the officers were quartered in two houses. None of these facilities were very warm during the winter. Quarters, the mess hall, and the military recreation facilities were segregated by race and gender. Although male African American soldiers, along with white servicemen and women, were allowed in the local bar for enlisted American personnel run by the American Red Cross, neither this club nor the American Red Cross Hotel set up any space for the wax in London. In response, Major Adams led the unit in a boycott of the alternate segregated facilities which the Red Cross offered. The same was true when the 6th AAA was not allowed to eat with white troops. Number 12. Women of the 6th AAA worked with male and female local civilians and with German POWs. In Birmingham, England, the women of the 6th AAA confronted warehouse stacked in ceiling with letters and packages. This backlog was estimated to be about two years' worth of mail. These buildings were unheated and dimly lit. The windows were blacked out to prevent light from showing during the nighttime raids. Rats sought out packages and spoiled cooks and cake and rats sought out packages of spoiled cakes and cookies. As it was cold winter, the women wore long johns and extra layers of clothing under their coats while working in the warehouse. The unit members were organized into three separate eight-hour shifts to work continually around the clock, seven days a week. They tracked individual service members by maintaining about seven million information cards, including serial numbers to distinguish different individuals who have the same name. Thirteen. The sixth AAA handled the sad duty of returning mail addressed to service members who had died and dealt with undeliverable mail, which was sent to their location for any uh, direction. They investigated insufficiently addressed envelopes for clues to determine the intended recipient. The 
is 6888 more initially, the subject of a great deal of curiosity from the local citizens of Birmingham who came to watch them work and even provided them with tea and biscuits for breaks. <laughs> In May 1945, the 6th AAA Battalion of about 850 women were sent to France to confront a separate backlog of mail. This backlog included letters that had been delayed for more than three years. It was estimated this process would take six months, but as in England, the women of the 6th AAA were able to complete the task at half the time estimated while in France, members of the team were able to participate in recreational activities. They even competed against other WAC battalions of white enlisted women under their unit basketball team. And of course, you know who took all the honors. They did. <laughs> when in France, the women enjoyed a higher class of living with maid service, chef cooked meals at the hotels. And when, and when the end of World War II came, However, the strength of the 6th AAA Central Postal Directory was reduced by nearly 300 personnel, with over 200 more women eligible to be discharged in January 1946. The morale of the battalion suffered as the workload fluctuated. There were not enough staff to produce the influx of holiday mail. Once again, they worked in unheated premises. In Paris, the 6th AAA also faced a new challenge the theft of small packages and certain items from packages to supply a war-deprived population. The women were forced to systematically search the local civilians they worked with in order to recover stolen items. 15. Only four women rested, only four women rested under the long rows of white marble headstones at Normandy American Cemetery in France, where nearly 9,000 other Americans Made, who made the ultimate sacrifice for their country are buried. Three of these women are African Americans. While in France, the six AAAs experienced tragedy. On July 8, 1945, Privates Mary Barlow, um, Mary Bankston, and Dolores Brown were all killed in a Jeep accident. Since the War Department did not provide funds for funerals of the women of the 6th AAA, I cannot believe that, um, these women pulled their resources to honor their deceased members. First Lieutenant Dorothy Scott found three unit members who had experience in mortuary work to take care of the bodies, and new unit members paid for their caskets. Memorial services were organized and held for the deceased, and Major Adams wrote to inform their families in the United States of their fate. Sergeant Brown, P.S.C. Barlow, and Mary Braxton were buried in honors in the Normandy American Cemetery. 16. The trip back home almost turned into the final insult of racism now for Lieutenant Colonel Charity Adams because she was the highest ranking woman on board, leaving her to command not only her unit, but also a white army nurse support detachment. The white nurses refused to have this authority. Tired and fed up, Adam struggled to keep her temper under control. She replied to their lack of respect by saying, if you cannot go home under my command, I suggest you pack your belongings, we sail at midnight, you have 20 minutes to get off, and I don't care whether you go home or not, but if you do go home, you go home under my command. Adam's turn to make a dramatic exit and almost ran into the ship's captain. He corrected her. The women only have 17 minutes to decide. Ah. <laughs> no one did. What's more important, the experience of the African American women of this particular time lays the groundwork for change, not only for the race, but also for women in general. Progress was made in terms of change in military policy and opportunities to replacing women in the military. Because, most, because of the challenges that these women experienced in World War II, African American women now have a much different role in our current military service. Unfortunately for those women, when they returned home, there was no acknowledgement of the hard work and the selfless service they were done. They were literally forgotten. 17. The 6th AAA honored the United States Army Museum in Fort Lee and was honored at the U.S. Army Museum in Fort Lee, Virginia. These beautiful exhibits with wax figures are included in the exhibit and educational program. 
1996, the Smithsonian Institute National Postmas Museum in Washington, D.C. put a program honoring Jerry Adams Early as a commander of the 6th AAA Central Postal Directory Battalion. On October 18, 1997, Early was also honored at the dedication of women in the military service for the American Memorial at Arlington National Cemetery. The 6th AAA is also maintained in records held by the institution, such as the National Archives for Black Women's History in Washington, D.C., the Library of Congress, which maintains the charity and its early papers. In 1902, a public school was named the Charity Adams Early Girls Academy, and it opened in Dayton, Ohio. Her early lived there from 1949 until her death on the 13th of January, 2002. After military service, Early went on to become a college dean and a community leader. 18. The Federal Gold Medal Bill honors these black all-female women. This honors this black all-female World War II battalion. The bill did not did pass the Senate, but not the House in 2018. Another bill is pending. And what I'm going to tell you, I actually have a picture, a 2002 that they'll finally get passed. And I have a picture up here of them celebrating that. It just says another bill is pending, and it was, and it passed. Odd women from the Battalion, Robinson, Baby, Campbell, Elizabeth Johnson, Lane King, and Delora Redder were presented at the dedication legislation by the United Senators from Kansas. Senator Jerry Moran introduced federal legislation to award the only black all-female battalion of the Women's Army Corps for service overseas during World War II with the Congressional Gold Medal. Danny Griffith McClellan, who I actually um, have a picture. I got to spend uh, two years ago. She lives in Aurora, and I got, um, I'm sorry, she lives in Tucson. Um, I got to spend um, December 7th with her um, down at the Capitol. And she's now in her late 90s. And I had just actually come from the post office. And I had said to her, I think they still need your help. And, <laughs> <laughs> and she still has a great sense of humor, and she laughed. Um, she reached the rank of major during World War II. She lives in Tempe, Arizona. She is one of the last surviving members of the 6th AAA Central Directory Postal Battalion, and she still is alive and doing well. She and other members of her battalion were trailblazers, and it's past time that we officially honor these incredible contributions to our troops during World War II, said Becky Housen, a New Hampshire Democrat, who had co-sponsored the original bill. 20. At this event, Gladys Schuster Carter evoked one of the greatest legacies of the 6th AAA by calling attention to women, particularly African-American women, currently serving in the United States military. Basically, she said, we're standing on your shoulders. And that's it.
American women served the United States Army and Navy as code breakers during World War II. While their brothers and husbands took up arms, these women moved to Washington and under the strict vows of secrecy, learned the meticulous work of breaking German and Japanese military codes. Y'all have heard that only so often that you probably <laughs> I like him. Okay, on slide two. Pouring over readings of encrypted messages, these women worked tirelessly in makeshift facilities in Washington, D.C., Arlington, Virginia, and Dayton, Ohio. Their code breaking skills shortened their, court, their code breaking skills shortened the war, saved countless lives, and gave them access to careers previously denied to them. In the process, many got their first taste of the big city, a lifelong friends, fell in and out of love amid the heartbreak of war. Orders were to never to, to detail, to reveal the detail of their wartime work. These women were all but written out of history. And what I want to tell you, that picture that you're looking at, that was only about 4% of the women completed college in the 40s. And this is Doc Braden, who actually was kind of, um, she's highlighted all through this by the author, with her girl and, um, with her nanny and her brother, and she went to Randolph Malcolm College. That's where they recruited her from. And her spirited mother had said, make sure she got into college. Slide three. Agnes Mary Driscoll, a former Texas high school math teacher, became one of the great cryptologists of all times. She cracked Japanese naval fleet codes during the 1920s and 30s. How did this all start? The United States did not end up the war. It was already in progress. When Pearl Harbor was struck on December 7, 1941, the country could not believe that they were caught off guard. Congress declared the war on Japan the next day, and Germany, the ally of Japan, declared war on the United States. America was ill-prepared for a war. After two decades of disarmament and isolation, America had a small navy, a a skeleton army, and no freestanding air force. But probably what was the most unbelievable, they had almost no intelligent operations. They knew they did not have time to set up a spy network, and so the country went to work setting up the first great coke breaking operation. It was early in November of 1941 that a handful of letters appeared in the college mailboxes at top-rated East Coast Women's Colleges. These women were invited to secret meetings and included private interviews. One young woman was only asked two questions. Did she like crossword puzzles and was she engaged to be married? Now, you know, ladies, they <laughs> never ask a man that. <laughs> it's more than 20 seniors at Wesley received these letters and were invited to these secret meetings. Number five. Their majors included math, botany, psychology, linguistics, and English. They all answered yes, they liked crossword muscles, and no, they were not on the brink of marriage. <laughs> Letters were going out at the same time to Grimoire, Mount Holyoke, Bernard, Radcliffe. These schools were part of the Seven Sisters that had been founded in the 19th century, when leading colleges like Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Dartmouth would not admit women. At the time these schools were founded, many considered higher education to be poorly suited for girls. Now these views have changed, and women were wanted urgently. Seven. These women were told the United States Navy was inviting them to embark on a field called critical analysis, a word they had never were to utter outside the confines of these gatherings. They were offered a training course, and if they passed, they would proceed to Washington after graduation. These letters kept going out to women's colleges across the nation, colleges where there were strong math and science departments were heavily recruited. Slide 8. What we have to remember is these young women graduated with advanced degrees, but there were no jobs for them. Like men, they could teach school, and that was about it. Both the Army and the Navy were competing with each other in recruiting these young women. The jobs they were taking were positions that had never offered to women before. 
support the Army, and the Navy told them, your country needs you, young ladies. What was the rationale of women recruitment? There was a letter in real Admiral Joy sent by Ada Comstock, and she was the president of, of one of the women's colleges, that said women were better suited to break the codes because they were better equipped for boring work. So, <laughs> required the most attention to detail rather than leaps of genius. In the 1940, women were used for the initial work to get things started so men could take over when more brilliance was required. <laughs> Slide 10. As the war progressed, the demand grew. In 1942, the United States grudgingly decided to admit women into the military service, which was a wildly controversial measure. Only bad women joined the service when the soldier, but soon, Recruiting was in full swing, and mothers were proudly snapping photos of her daughter in their uniform. These women broke codes and actually turned the tide of the war because of their brilliance. These ideas changed. When women code breakers were recruited, we were losing World War II because there was no information as to what the enemy, namely Germany and Japan, were doing. The women code breakers were one key reason for the Allies winning World War II. We want to get the men and all those people morale from the front lines, lots of credit, but there are a lot of people behind the scenes that made a big difference. Slide 11. Women rushed to enlist. One reporter described the WAC recruiting station as a tidal wave of pride. Women who tested high for intelligence and aptitudes and passed background checks were routed into the code breaking service. The other idea was women were brought in was because it was for free men to go up to war and possibly die. Yet the work these women were doing was intended to ensure that these men lived. All of these women had brothers and lovers and fiancés and friends who were serving. A number of these women broke codes that told the fate of these men who were important in their lives. Well, during World War II, post-traumatic stress syndrome had not been identified. But the stress of knowing the fate of the American soldiers and either not being able to do anything about it or not being able to break a code in time to save lives took its toll. And one example was one code breaker who was recruited to work on high-level projects. She was a brilliant mathematician who suffered a breakdown under these conditions and really never recovered. You have to understand that just because information was available, it could not always be acted on because the enemy would know that you'd broken the code and they'd change it. So if you knew a ship someone you left on was going to be bombed, that couldn't be a chair. Slide 13. The American code breaking operations ramped up very quickly at the start of the war. Britain would lead the code breakers effort in the European theater, and the Americans would take responsibility for the vast Pacific whole team. It was about this time when the Army outlined what makes a good code breaker. First, they found out that a person's background did not necessarily correlate to a successful code breaker. They had PhDs who were hopeless, and some high school dropouts who became first grade performers. Code breakers required literacy, number accuracy, creativity, painstaking, attention to detail, a good memory, and a willingness to hazard guesses. It required a tolerance for drudgery and a boundless reserve of injury, of, a boundless reserve of energy and optimism. What we're seeing here is the 15. Is that the? Are we on 15? No. Okay. That's uh, these women work. These women worked around the clock and often didn't know whether to eat breakfast or dinner when they finished the shift. Navy code breakers, this shows Edith Reynolds recruited from Vassar with some of her colleagues. A task had really not been developed uh, for these skills, so they were able to get some of the tests to say, would you be a good code breaker? We really just had to train them and see how they did. You have to remember, these women who became civil service employees took their security oath very seriously. And they came from a generation when they did not receive credit for achievements in public life. 
And yet, these women were instrumental at every stage. They ran complex office machines that had been refigured to code breaking purposes. They served as translators. They developed traffic strategies, which is one way of forwarding messages that come in all together. 16. They tracked weather codes, a number of predominantly female teams attacked and broke major code systems. Once broken, a code must be exploited and often rebroken. And the women formed the really assembly lines to do this. <coughs> Since the need for more women to break codes was needed, only about 12% of the women who went to college were recruited from all walks of life. They got them from everywhere. Um, and the potentials and skills, they just trained them, and those that passed the test got to do it. By the end of the war, there were about 20,000 code breakers, and 11,000 of these were women. An example of women recruited from other places beyond uh, women's colleges was Doc Brady, and I talked about this. She was a feisty Virginia school teacher who leaped at the chance to take a job with the Army at a place called Arlington. Doc was recruited for the United States Army Intelligence Service. She would be paid $1,620 a year, and this was almost <coughs> twice what she had been made teaching. Because of the influx of these women in short periods of time, barracks were thrown together in this community and called Arlington Farm. It covered 24 acres, and it was dubbed Girls Town. Slide 18. As I said before, there was great competition between the Army and the Navy code breakers, and they were hesitant to share information with each other. Politics never changed, right? Mm -hmm. The Navy wanted to offer more incentives to their code breakers, and on July, July 1st, 1942, the Navy waves were recognized. Women who were serving with the Navy as code breakers had the opportunity to stay as civil servants or join the waves. Many joined the waves. Slide 19. This is Dorothy Rommel, and I talked, we saw her when she was a little girl, and just a little bit, they really did focus on her on the book. She grew up in Pennsylvania, she wanted to be a math teacher, but the dean of women in NAA State College called her and told her the United States Army had another idea for her, and we're all so blessed they did. Um, the code system for the Germans and the Japanese were very different. It seems confusing to me how they really coordinated with each other. The Germans basically used ensiphering machines that changed the letter in a code daily. They were called Enigma machines and were portable and could be taken in battle. So one day a B would be a J and another day a B would be an H and it just changed. So that's how these work. Now the Japanese, not to be outdone, and, and um, used a number system of four numbers, when calculated, came up with another number which represented a letter. These were the two systems. How these two people with these two entirely different systems were able to talk, I have no idea. Imagine breaking these kind of codes in your own language and how much harder in a different language. The techniques uses was to work in teams, sometimes 12 hours a day, and each team worked on a different aspect of the problem. Audits that helped most were military transcripts, which had a strong salutation. If you were able to break the salutation, you had a strong key to the rest of the marriage. Uh, no, not the rest of the marriage, the rest of the message. Maybe you have a strong key to the rest of the marriage, too. Um, but um, what's interesting about this, if you think about it, um, I don't know if we have Americans did so much, but the Japanese and the Germans always use salutations, and they always use the same ones. And so if you could figure out that day what that salutation was, and you kind of knew the salutations are you the same thing, you could then kind of look at the rest of that message and interpret it. 21. Another item that worked in the code breaker's favor was both Germany and Japan had code books that they provided to the fan units to help decipher the daily communications. In battles with the enemy, these code books were captured. And while they not, may not have been the current code book, they were a strong foundation for breaking down messages. 22. Another benefit was the Japanese commander of the Navy required each of his ships. He was a little, do you all know what OCD is? Yeah. 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 He, was, he just had to have his, you know, all, all, all the T's crossed and I's dotted. 
Um, so he would ask every one of his ships to check in with him each day as to how much fuel they had and set the course for the day. This required a lot of paper traffic and repetition messages, and it made it much easier for us to track what those ships were doing. As the code breakers became more efficient and more able to decipher codes, one benefit is that they had a list of what provisions, food, fuel, and needed supplies the war would be delivered on these ships. These messages also listed the routes of these vessels would be taken and estimated the date of arrival. So every day, he made them, each ship sent him a communication, and it just fell into our laps. 24. Yes. By destroying these cargo lines, the enemy became more vulnerable to doubt some flaws. 23. Besides breaking codes of the enemy, they also sent out false codes of the American Allies' plans. So when invasions were planned, false chatter went out describing the attacks in different locations. And so the enemy would move troops to that target. This tactic was really important in the planning of D-Day. 24. The false message said the Allies would mass in Scotland to mount an invasion of Norway. This was to say, this was to have the Germans keep their troops near Norway and not close to France before the invasion was planned. 25. This is a picture, this picture that you're seeing here. It's a picture of Adolf Hitler and the commander of, of the Japanese troops and um, uh, beating together. And um, the Allies called uh, the German thing purple. And uh, the United States um, is just talking about what they did to kind of follow up on these messages. This just basically is just a picture of Hitler and the, and the leader of the Japanese people. 26. The German military forces used their own inside machines, as I told you about, and they were just little, you know, they almost looked like little computers or something. You can see them there, that they could carry out the field. 27. Even with the long hours and great demands of code breaking, there was still time for fun. Mm -hmm. the girls went to the beach on holidays, rode to servicemen, and had great parties at the barracks. Sometimes these parties got so out of hand that the police were called to quiet things down. <laughs> the military seemed to look the other way to these parties, probably feeling it was good to let loose of the tension that the job had brought about. As one officer put it, unlike men, they're not going to get drunk and start bragging and tell everything they know. <laughs> <laughs> On the rare days off, the women would ride buses and streetcars to the beaches of Virginia and Maryland. This group of Arlington Hall code breakers, you see Doc Pro and, um, and her best friend. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. For many of these women who worked in these positions, this would be the highlight of their lives. Certainly their most satisfying job. They went home to take jobs, become wives, mothers, and some used the GI Bill to gain more education. These women did stay in touch. There was a round robin letter that went around for 40 years for those that had worked together. And I could share this um, presentation with the Sons of the American Revolution, and one of them spoke up and said, was it in code? <laughs> <laughs> Slide 29. This is a picture of Stephen Chamberlain. He was the operation officer for General Douglas MacArthur, and he declared that the code breaker shortened the war, helped save thousands of lives. The post-war accolades did not mention that more of this, more of this group, that more of them, 10,000 code breaker women. It was never mentioned that women did the main thing. Uh, slide 30. Uh, Dean and Doctor's friendship, and they, we saw them at the beach before, remained so strong that Crow insisted Dot and her husband Jim Bruce come to Washington to meet her own fiancé, Bill Cable, and give their stamp of approval before she would marry him. <laughs> and there's a cute story that um, talks about um, they wanted to rent an apartment. They wanted to get out of these barracks. So they find this apartment, and 
um, they don't have a mattress. And so they go to the, they go on the bus and they find a mattress, but they can't get it home. So they asked the guy who ran the, the mattress firm, would he take it, could he put it in his car and bring it to him? And he said, if you'll cook me eggs, I'll do it. <laughs> and they just happened to have eggs, and so he brought the mattress and they cooked eggs and they got their apartment. <laughs> Slide 31. Many women stayed friends for decades after their service. A group of Navy women kept around Robin Leonard for 70 years. Oh, yeah. This group included um, Elizabeth Butler, Ruth Schroeder, um, and George O'Connor. 32. I love this picture because this was the lady that actually inspired the book. This this particular code breaker, and this is Dodge. The women took their oath of secrecy so seriously that even now at the age of 97, oh. Dorothy Braden Bruce, here at a grand party with her grandchildren, has trouble bringing herself to utter certain words that she was told never to say outside the grounds of Arlington. And believe it or not, her children and her grandchildren knew nothing about her service until this book was written. <laughs> And I think, do we have another slide? No. Is that it? Yeah, well, that's the end of that. And so, um, you've got questions or anything you want to answer about that? <laughs> Sorry for the rough start, but I think we made it work. Yeah. 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 That's good. Good. Any, any comments or any? Sometimes I have people who were involved or they have stories that they know. If you're a code breaker and you're keeping it to yourself, I understand. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we do have it. He, this man has the book. Oh, okay. okay. And it, it is a great book. Um, so much more in it than what I could put in there.